So let's talk about something new. So in, in everything that uh, we've talked about so far in this class, I've always just given you the values of the principal stresses, right? Or we talk about ways to estimate them. Right? You know, the vertical stress, you can come up with a pretty good estimate. Uh, but how, you know, we haven't really talked about how you can actually measure, you know, in a, in a sort of a quasi-experimental way, actually measure the institute stresses. And one way is through hydraulic fracturing to determine S3. And I say S3 because what we're talking about is the minimum principal stress. And it could be the vertical stress, or it could be the minimum horizontal stress. Depends on if it's a normal strike slip. If it's normal or strike slip, it's going to be the minimum horizontal stress. But if it's a rever reverse faulting regime, and again, I'm talking about Anderson classification here. If it's reverse faulting, then it's going to be the vertical stress, the minimum principal stress. And so we can use uh, basically little hydraulic fractures. And I drew, you know, my picture here is, is really the sort of cartoonist figure for a hydraulic fracture from a stimulation event, right? We're, we're not going to produce these hydraulic fractures to stimulate. They're not going to be great big fractures like they're drawn here. These are, in fact, you know, kind of the smallest fractures you can get away with uh, because really uh, this is a, it's a time thing. It, it takes time to do these tests. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, you're not, you don't, well, you, you typically do these while drilling. You, you, you stop, you perform this test. It's called a, uh, it's got several names, uh, extended leak off test, a leak off test, a mini frac. These are all sort of similar names for uh, formation integrity tests. Uh, we'll talk about the kind of specific differences between them, but essentially the, they're almost the same test in every case. And these are done while drilling. Uh, and they're done, you know, you, you don't want to produce vi very long, you know, stimulated natural fractures like this because you're going to, I mean, hydraulic fractures like this because then you're going to run into lost circulation problems and other things. So, you know, uh, the first thing is, ooh, um, just briefly to talk about hydraulic fracture initiation in a vertical well, right? So here we're not necessarily talking about the propagation of a fracture, but rather the initiation, like when will a fracture initiate at the wellbore wall, okay? And so it'll initiate at the wellbore wall when the hoop stress goes into tension, right? So if you remember, we have some stress versus theta and it oscillates around, you know, which not that many times, right? It's only <laughs> be like that. So it, it oscillates as you go around, and if say this was zero no stress. Whenever this goes into tension, the hoop stress goes into tension, so this is sigma theta theta, you're going to have a chance to initiate fractures. And we typically say the rock strength is zero. So it, typically, if this goes into any kind of tensile stress, uh, then you'd say that you initiate a fracture. But Um, there could be that the rock, I mean, most rocks have a little bit of tensile strength, right? So we'd say that's T0. So the point at which a, a fracture will initiate in tension is equal to T0. And this is almost close to zero, but just in general, we'll say that, you know, you could have some tensile fracture. And if you were to look at, you know, again, this is a vertical, this is a vertical well. So I guess I didn't say it. This is the this is the solution of the Kirsch equation at the wellbore wall, right? For the minimum value of th sigma theta theta, right? So if the full Kirsch equation solution has um, this oscillatory nature as a function of theta, if you minimize theta, then you get this this equation. 
This has a temperature term, which we may or may not include that. But, so this is probably what you saw in the notes before. But where, where this has a minimum, right, the location of this with respect to SH min and SH max is going to be where? Where along the wellbore wall? With respect to the azimuth of SH min and SH max. Do what? It's, it's going to be at SH max. So tensile fractures typically initiate at the azimuth of SH max. And you know that has to do with the fact that if we say we look at a fracture here that's going to grow from a wellbore. If this is SH max, let's just say we have some fracture growing there. If, if this is SH max, what is this? SH min, right? right? So in other words, this is SH min. So the force being applied to the face of the fracture, the pressure applied to the face of the fracture is SH min, which means the pressure in the fracture itself has to exceed SH min to grow. Right? So the pressure in here must be greater than that to grow. Otherwise, the fracture is going to be closed due to equilibrium arguments. And of course, you know, if, if the, pr if, uh, you know, it's sort of obvious, right, Be just by, uh, by name alone, right, SH max is bigger than SH min, right? So if the pore pressure in here were to exceed SH max, then it's long ago exceeded SH min. So, you know, you get you get tensile you get fractures that grow perpendicular to SH min because this is the minimum energy configuration. Right? Sort of nature always evolves in a way that minimizes energy, and so this is the this is the minimum energy configuration. It takes l takes less energy to open a fracture against the pressure of SH min, and that's why in vertical wells. In vertical wells, you always get fracture growth at SH min. Now again, it, this is a you know this is not this is excluding any heterogeneity, any natural fractures, lots of other complexity. Right? This is a very simplified example. <coughs> So, 